Ooh, we're going to have the surprise buy from you. Na'Vi. This is not what you normally think. around towards A, but VP struggles to answer. Then again, Snacks is right here. Here. here we go, Taz and Bialy. Lucky Taz. He keeps out dueling with that lowly SMG. He's he's right the benches he here, and the bomb is still making its way over there. Picks five, up six. the bomb, and with 18 seconds left, he can go for the plan, but he's been too late. Paul decides to just go jumping in with the first block. And he's, he's going to get it. And Envy, they take the second round. Today, Counter-Strike Global Offensive is a first-person shooter powerhouse, known by every competitive and casual player within the genre, and even outside of it, with different professional and amateur tournaments taking place every week, if not every day, with prize pools ranging from nothing but empty glory up to thousands of dollars, euros and other currencies across the world. Arguably, Counter-Strike alongside StarCraft are the games that popularized competitive gaming, later known as cybersports, but today we just simply call it eSports. And though different challengers appear from time to time, none seem to have the same staying power that Counter-Strike has had. Well, maybe the aforementioned StarCraft, but today, or rather this year, the 2019, Counter-Strike celebrates its 20th anniversary. In fact, the first ever version, Beta 1, for the game came out in 90th June 1999. Still, a lot of us, even more grizzled fans, seem to forget where this game came from, or what leaps and bounds it had to endure to get to where it is today. So, I sat down one morning, opened up my laptop, and started writing what would turn out to be my first ever documentary. Or as close as I can get to it, as I'm not particularly impartial to it. As I reminisced about being a young Latvian boy, first seeing this modern looking shooter, I recall something grabbing me and never really letting go to this day. See, for me, Counter-Strike is not just an old game, it's way more than that. It's almost the whole world of first-person shooters to me, the golden standard that I compare everything to. The coding, stability, map design, gameplay, all of these little things, and even more, are examples of what a game should be, or should not. I grew up with it, and indeed it's engraved in my brain after literally thousands of hours. Maybe even tens of thousands, I really don't know anymore. But I still remember having fun with friends in the local library, just booting up a match. So, for this special occasion, I decided to look into the history of Counter-Strike. Half-Life takes the world by storm, its gold source engine while still being a heavily modified Quake engine attracted not only players but also modders and in a rather short time span, all sorts of weird, experimental and sometimes even interesting and good playable mods started to crop up. Among them was one called Counter-Strike. Beta 1, released by Ming Gooseman Lee with assistance of Jess Cliffy, who actually is the voice of the radio commands. The mod itself was a modern tactical shooter where contrary to other online shooters for the time, did not feature a respawn mechanic, instead opting for a kind of a permadeath for players until the end of the round. Now, for this project I went out to see if I could get a few answers from Gooseman himself, and yet I had my doubts, as frankly, in the past I've been ignored by almost all developers when I start asking questions. But, as a surprise, he answered. So then, what motivated Gooseman to make Counter-Strike? Apparently it was a follow-up from his previous mod called Navy Seals, and being fascinated by the counter-terrorist forces at the time, the next mod would feature both the setting and gameplay accordingly. As to why the game featured round-based respawn, Gooseman cites Action Quake and Navy Seals, the mod he made before, and opted to give Counter-Strike the same treatment, making the game more tense, forcing players to work together and strategize instead of just running and gunning as was quite common with Quake and Unreal games. The first beta featured only hostage rescue mode, 4 maps, 9 weapons and 2 teams. Mind you, Valve would not release SDK, the software development kit for Half-Life, until April 7, 1999. Yet, the work on the mod had already begun, and though the setting and gameplay were more or less decided upon, and even some models were made, Gooseman also sized the first beta to be the most difficult thing of making the game, due to lack of maps and willing map makers. After the release of Beta 1, Counter-Strike rapidly gained popularity, and subsequent beta updates were released soon after. Beta 2 and 3 added more maps and weapons, but then Beta 4 introduced Bomb Defusal, or simply DE map. 
maps that quickly overshadowed other game modes, even to this day. In late 1999, Guzman started working for Barking Dog Studios, but chose to focus more and more time on his studies, leaving less time to develop betas. It was also this time when Valve recognized the importance of the project and offered to pay Barking Dog to help making Beta 5. Actually, if you go back now and look at the deep train map, you'll notice a pop dog icon on one of the train carts, which was the internal team at Barking Dog Studios dedicated for the first-person shooter games. As the time passed and betas kept rolling out, such game modes as Escape and Assassination got released. But Escape quickly got phased out and Assassination, while still lingered and stumbled, like a drunk in a family gathering in Christmas, it would never be seen after Condition Zero. According to some speculations, Valve acquired Counter-Strike brand in early 2000s and later that year announced a full release of a standalone game. After two more beta releases in 9th November 2000, the Counter-Strike 1.0 was available for the public. So there I was, the young Yamex first seeing Counter-Strike. I frankly can't remember exactly what the first version I played was, but I know for certain it was this screen. And as far as I can recall, the oldest version that comes to my mind is 1.1. So I'll stick with it. Uh, my name is Envy. Uh, I'm a caster for a CSGO at, uh, at the moment, for Baltic mm -hmm. Esports League, for Baltic in general, for Goyz Animal. Yeah. And, and I'm the producer. I'm the producer of everything uh, around the Baltic Esports League and uh, all the other things that involves in that. And a caster as well, because we couldn't find another caster for PUBG scene, so I do that on the sideways as well. I know that I'm. I started a bit earlier than you, right? Yeah. I, I started with yeah. 1.3, but I'm not 100% sure that it was 1.3. It was like, because I didn't have the computer in my home, I was playing in a, in a computer cafe in a stingy place where Somewhere. everyone was playing Counter-Strike in those days and Run Escapes, one of those games that, that, that was packed with those people. But I started 1.3, but vaguely I can remember that because I was playing with arrow keys and and okay. I was figuring out how mouse even works, but after that I know for sure that I played 1.5 and then the rest of them after they came out. Yeah, for me instantly it was 1.6. I never even had the chance to play like 1.5, 1.3, always yeah. up and people said that there is a version called 1.5, I was like, huh, no, you're lying. <laughs> There's no way, like, this has to be the first one, the 1.6, but no, it wasn't. Oh, yes, I, I remember because the first map I played was Ice World, and okay. that's like the, the history <laughs> is behind that map, map, but it wasn't like Dust or, or Aztec no, 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 or no, 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 like no. for the other players, but I remember it was Ice World, and... It was something new, like the FPS games particularly, because I was playing before that, like what I was, six or seven years old back then. So I was playing strategic games. And then to be involved in FPS, like that was something new, because before that, the only FPS shooter I knew was uh, the Doom, the first one where you move the arrow keys and you try to shoot some pixels. And that was the, f the first introduction to something new in the 3D FPS shooter. Yeah. That's a mind-boggling thing. Was for me, my second cousin showed me the game. Second cousin. My second cousin, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I started, basically, when I first saw it, it one of my first ideas was like to cast it. I don't know. Because whilst he was playing, he, he, he mm -hmm. didn't allow me to play. I needed to oh. talk about how he's playing. So basically, my first feel of the game was talking about the game. Already. Not, not, not even playing it. For me, back when I played it, while I can't recall exactly what I thought of it the first time I saw it, one thing is certain. To me, this game felt like home, something I could return to and have fun with. I made new friends thanks to it and it certainly was an integral part of who I am today. I know, it perhaps is funny or weird for some people to have a psychotic murder simulator described as integral part of their being, or at least that's how some parents with too much free time on their hands described it back then. You see, when I first touched Counter-Strike, I was mere first grader, an 8-year-old Yamex. And yet today, these kids of the time are all grown up. Believe it or not, it was one of the things in my life that both inspired me and encouraged me to learn more about games and everything that had to do with them. Later in life I learned programming, tried my hand in modeling, drawing, animation, map design, game design, audio and video production, PC building and even more. And all these things I can attribute to three games. Duke Nukem 3D, Half-Life and of course, 
Counter-Strike, each of which I've spent thousands of hours not only enjoying, but examining and learning from. The second you come home from school, you're, uh, you're at, at the computer, you're playing CS, yeah. and that was it, and, and then you go to sleep. And now, for five years, I've been casting it, and I've been earning money with it, it's just, it's, it's insane. Yeah. I love it, I love it. Uh, the C, like, CS has brought so much to me, and they, they, these experiences that we've had, Hyperton Talent, Hyperton League, like, everything has been just such a great adventure. I, I was looking at, like, the big players out there, like SK Spawn, that, that, yeah, that's, in yeah. my mind, he's the... He's the legend behind everything. The original. And, yeah, he showed that like the CS go, like the CS 1.6. Yeah. You can earn the money through that. And I was looking at that, and I was one day thinking maybe I'm gonna be there. And I actually did. I I, I traveled uh, in the different regions of Europe to play in the LAN tournaments as well, and for like this in Sweden for the Dream Hack, the under league, not the highest one, but under like the so it's called like the second league. So it was fun. It's the it it has only been good things out of that I, I wouldn't yeah. okay I, I, I finished my school all right so <laughs> all right I did I did finish but otherwise than that it's just uh, I uh, right now I work in everyday basis like uh, I earn money to put the, the bread on the table through through that that I played Counter Strike few few ten of years ago I still remember playing a lot of 1.3 and 1.5 versions in the same library with friends, but if there's one version we all remember the best, pretty much without a doubt it has to be 1.6, the last one. Along with the fixes and map changes, everyone was super excited, excited for... Your thoughts? The tactical shield. The tactical oh, shield. oh shit. <laughs> I loved it. No, no. 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 I... I liked it because you could like make all those thinking? all those pyramids. You can make all those pyramids and everything else. It was just yeah. It was all fun. right, all right. You are talking about memes, but I'm talking yeah. about technical things. You know? Yeah. Imagine in a land tournament when you you <laughs> peek around the corner and there's like five fuckers with a shield standing yes. there, and you're like, well, I'm fucked. Yeah, exactly. That's why they're banned. It. It's so it's it's mind boggling how you. You sit at the desk and you think, hmm, maybe we can, uh, let's, let's introduce to our players with the thing that makes you invincible. Hey, Guys. that can't go wrong, right? So yeah, I hate that thing. <laughs> to, to conclude everything what we said, <laughs> no. It's fun. Alright, no. so in one of the most recent patches did implement the tactical shield. If you haven't played, I oh, haven't no, played. Wait, hold on. You are a caster and you don't know. I have played it, but I didn't know about the shield. We are they not. They added shield recently. No one to is the Battle casting. Royale, right? Only yeah. Battle yeah. Royale. To the Danger Zone. Oh my god. Still, even if we put that walking meme aside, the competitive scene by now had risen tremendously, having different tournaments all over the world. Either due to the game's skill ceiling, strategical thinking requirements, team play, modern aesthetic or perhaps combination of all these things, Counter-Strike, due to its already prominent player base, seemed to branch out in competitive scene on its own and quickly rising to the top of PC shooter eSports. For me, what sets the game apart is still the fact that you have to learn how to manage your money from round to round, how each gun works due to them not having completely random recoil, but a set pattern with some random bullet spread, as well as the sound design that was, and still is, extremely important. Nevertheless, the tight gameplay that Counter-Strike offered was never really beat by other shooters, and eventually Quake, Unreal Tournament, Call of Duty and other players just gravitated towards the game that had hallmarks of a predictable, skill-based and competitive gameplay. Though before we delve into the competitive, there are a few interesting things to look into for the full picture. After the release of Counter-Strike, the work on the next version of the game was started. Usman started working on Counter-Strike 2, which unfortunately later got shelved, while Rogue Entertainment was given the task of making a spin-off sort of a game. Soon after, in fact in the E3 2001, the announcement for Condition Zero was made. Though unfortunately, months later, developer company went under, leaving Valve with an unfinished, half-baked hot potato in their hands. 
Enter Gearbox Software to the rescue. According to Mr. Pitchford from another wonderful documentary about Half-Life done by Danny from Noclip YouTube channel, Gearbox did the work on Condition Zero while losing money and due to sporadic choices and design decisions made by Valve. For the game, it turned into a nightmare and eventually, quoting Mr. Pitchford, They threw a little money at it, but not nearly what we spent. So I was like, this is, this is kind of bullshit. <laughs> um, so I walked, I told him, fuck off. Finally, the third developer was appointed to Condition Zero, the Ritual Entertainment, who were contracted to work on a single-player campaign for the game. After that version of the game gained mediocre or even low scores from the test audiences, Valve decided to just axe it and involve fourth developer, the Turtle Rock Studios, who ended up gathering everything that previous developers managed to accomplish, which involved single-player challenge mode that Gearbox worked on and the deleted scenes for the single-player campaign as one package in 2004. To this day, Condition Zero is notable for being the only Counter-Strike game with a single-player campaign. Personally, I find it quite fun and very silly, not to mention that one of the missions take place here in Latvia, my homeland. Hmm, maybe, maybe that's why I'm a bit more forgiving than other fans. Anyways, at this time, as I alluded before, competitive scene back in the camp Counter-Strike was starting to gain momentum more and more, but it was not to last for too long, and Condition Zero? Well, there was another issue for its stumbling, fumbling release. The release of Counter-Strike Source. Mere months of the release of Condition Zero, the time was set for Half-Life 2 to greet the public. With its all-new Source engine, amazing graphics and physics. To put it simply, the game was groundbreaking. But funnily enough, if we don't count the leaked version of Half-Life 2, Counter-Strike Source was released two weeks before Half-Life. Now, in the arena of competitive shooters, there were three Counter-Strike games. One of which had a player base and established competitive scene. One that, well, tripped, broke its nose, got up, tripped again, losing a few teeth, got up for the second time, tripped again, breaking its jaw, and somehow getting up for the third time, tripped once more, splitting its skull open. And then finally we had the third game, that was the new guy, fresh off the line, shiny with new fancy physics tricks up its sleeve. But after testing, community, despite upgraded looks, was not having any of it. Personally, I loved Source. To this day, I have fond memories of playing zombie and surf modes, gun game, and even just the plain old vanilla matches. But then why did everyone seem to dislike it? I loved how you could be a little bit cheeky and hide a bomb under physics objects and yes, yeah, sure, it was pretty disgusting in competitive scene. To be frank, that was not the worst. Many players cite the hitbox discrepancies as well as the bad hit detection and many other details being by far the biggest unwelcome change and left pro players angry and quite confused as to what had happened to their favorite game. The a AK was ridiculous. You just press mouse one and things die. The same with a uh, like AVP and the de like Deagle was the strongest gun in the game. I think. So would the pros go back to 1.6? Well, some did. Others just simply stopped as 1.6 was already aging. After all, it was slowly but surely losing its popularity contest among competitive esports games. As the old StarCraft was still kicking around and up and coming original Dota starting gathering popularity. Like even when CS:GO came out, like 1.6 yeah. was like he was still holding its place. Yeah. A stubborn community. Yeah. 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 It wouldn't be for the next eight years until the fans of the series would see a new iteration of the game. After learning from their mistake of not paying attention to the competitive scene for their games, Valve, together with Hidden Path Entertainment, had finally started to design the next games to address the esports hungry gamers. Counter Strike Global Offensive, and one year after, Dota 2 were released with the latest technologies and gameplay features in mind, improving spectating and even giving casting and replay features with competitive scene in mind. It sure looked like Global Offensive and Dota 2 were primed to be the next big things. Yet, when Global Offensive was concerned, it all would be for naught if gameplay could not reflect what the original 1.6 was capable of. Even though I played it when it came out and hated the UI, the gameplay was on point. 
point. It was smoother than ever. Sure, it still ran on the Source engine that the Counter-Strike Source did. Well, generally speaking. The gameplay was fine-tuned to such a polish. Finally, 1.6 could be given a well-earned retirement after these years. Over the next few years, adding a few weapons here and there, changing some mechanics, tweaking all kinds of things and such. The Pro League, just like an unfortunate teammate spotting a friendly grenade under their feet, exploded. With the popularity of live streaming and good old-fashioned video commentary, both the viewership and participation in competitive matches was growing without end in sight. There was no way in 1.6 to cast alone. Like, if you were sitting in your room and you wanted to cast a game, it was, you couldn't connect the servers, you couldn't get the access, you you had to do so much of the scripting okay. ready for when you join in the server to make sure that everything is view viewable on the screen as well. And usually it didn't work if you didn't con contact everyone there as well. But now in CSGO, it's just, you press one button, you join the game, everything is shown there, all the yeah. money, yeah, the all the information, grenades. And to make an overlay for CSGO, it takes a day or two in a little bit of scripting and you are ready. So, yeah. If I wanted to cast, like, when 1.6 was up there, where would I cast? There was no way to cast on YouTube, like, to stream yeah. on YouTube. There were no Twitch back then. There was, like, OwnNet TV and some other shady websites where you put your live stream and you you get one or two viewers because no one knew what the fuck live stream is. It's like any person can go into the internet, sign up for yeah. the tournaments and come inst instantly play for LAN events. Yeah. As well, streams are always like, oh, and every everything's already like covered. Like, the, exactly. And as well, like the mouse pad, like mouse, everything like, like the, like the what equipment. Mouse pad? Equipment, I had, exactly. I had a book. Yes, for exactly. the first five years that I played Counter Strike. Or nothing on the table, yeah. like you were hoping that everything was good. So that would be it, you may think. Four versions of the game and no more. Well, as a brief intermission, here are some notes on spin-offs for our beloved franchise. In 2004, for Japanese market only, Counter-Strike Neo was published by Namco, with oversight from Valve, an arcade shooter that featured terrorists and aliens. Yes, I... I'm not joking. There are even working versions you can find somewhere on the web, so have fun. 2007, Counter-Strike Online, made for, quote, Asia's market, was a game that embraced free-to-play model with microtransactions, leveling, weapon purchasing in main menu, or renting. Yes, it had that system. Anyways, it was a licensed product by Nexon, that are quite known for licensing a lot of games to Asia or from it. Then, later in 2012, they licensed for Counter-Strike Online 2, that basically was the same version of Counter-Strike Source, but it was not a clone due to many changes. Still, it had the same old shenanigans. And more! Then, in 2014, Nexon, again, released the Counter-Strike Nexon Zombies, but instead of it being a global offensive version, it was back to the gold source engine for a, you guessed it, zombie-themed, free-to-play Counter-Strike for Asia. Safe to say the game was critically panned due to visuals and microtransactions. Hmm. I start to sense a pattern here. Also, as you look at the character models, yeah, you know what's up. So then that would be currently it. All the mainline games, as well as the licensed spin-offs that the franchise had the pleasure or displeasure of spawning after Gooseman's original idea 20 years ago. Now, come to think of it, I was only 6 when the first beta came out and about 8 when I first played it. So, in a way, Counter-Strike has been with me ever since I can remember. When you look back at the games and the industry in this time, thanks to Counter-Strike community as well as the games themselves, the way matches and gameplay has been done for Pro Leagues has been established, at least for shooters. The minimal amount of randomness or its complete removal from games mechanics and environment was established by 1.6 and Source, while advancements in casting, commentary, software and techniques used came from popularity of Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Of course, I cannot forego a rather unique change that the Global Offensive introduced. The weapon skins. 
Now, on its own, yeah, sure, Yamix would love an FN2000 instead of AUG or SG and Spaz12 instead of Nova, but I'm talking about the loot boxes that many already consider as gambling as is. Yet what I'm referring to here is the subsequent skin gambling and betting sites for the competitive matches. These days it's way less common, but skip about two years ago and it will be a rather common thing to see among fans of different pro teams. There have been even multiple scandals over throwing games for benefit of the skins and their subsequent sales. The pro leagues of any sport really is filled with stories like this, so it shouldn't be really coming as a surprise, yet it always is sad to see and read about. But with the skins, I like how it looks, I like the idea of it. I like that like you play and you get the, like those achievements, like you get drop the skins, you, you wear them, it's it's fun. But the fact that like there's the, the betting sites and, uh, and you have to like buy the keys to yeah, get those well, skins, I understand it's a business, and maybe it's 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 a bit dirty business, but I kind of it, uh, like 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 come to see the betting, uh, it, like for every sport that's a part of it's it, there. right? It's there, like it, for it, hockey, for fun, for yeah. football, and for esports as well. Yeah, it's gonna it, it, you you can't fight it. Yeah, it's gonna be there, and that what brings like the other side of the viewer base that we couldn't get at otherwise. That's why it didn't have involved in that size as it is and, yeah. and we have the money to give out for the prize pools only because the, one of the biggest sponsors are on the bidding sides. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I, it's mixed feelings. I, it, it's good. It gives some more money in the game. Maybe they're going to fix it one day. Yeah. Still, will this make me stop playing Counter-Strike? No, no, definitely not. As to this day, I still, every few years or so, boot up Condition Zero and replay the single-player campaign. I still boot up a custom server with Surf for zombie modes, even sometimes you can see me play competitive, and I still enjoy it all. I, I would say it's the... As you still can hear in the background, there are pl people playing the CSGO in these days, and those are people that weren't even born in the day that I played one point whatever in yeah. that time and it's just it's still there like the the name counter-strike yeah. even my girlfriend knows what counter-strike is and she never played a game in her life oh like yeah she, she played something well, who knows when but she knows what counter-strike is and she knows few good <laughs> pro players and not because of me but before that even like it's it's something out there In the end, I look at my 8-year-old self, in my small town, first picking up the 1.1 and playing my favorite assault map with friends. I cannot but to stop and smile, thinking how much of this game had influenced my perception of what a perfect and fun shooter should be. And yes, even the dreaded tactical shield of 1.6 had taught me a lesson. I certainly know that my world and the world of shooters, even competitive gaming, would never be the same without five terrorists and counter-terrorists battling out on Dust 2, Office, Italy, Inferno, Aztec and many more. The legacy this game holds is undeniable and in many players' hearts holds a special place. So for this, the 20th birthday, perhaps in recognition of all the achievements, let's boot up a match of 1.6 or even beta 1, and play. Some of you may experience it for the first time, others may slip back into their old comfy slippers. Regardless of which one you are, we will all rush B and drop guns for our friends. And more importantly, we can all take a moment and say, thank you, Counter-Strike. Thank you for everything.